The year is 1859. A French physician named Octave Landry is following a series of patients with a terrifying unknown condition. A strange ascending paralysis starting at the feet and marching up the body. Three weeks in, one of his patients passes away after his breathing muscles are paralyzed. 200 years later, we understand why and how this happens. But this condition still takes the lives of over 10,000 people per year. And in many cases, it all starts with undercooked chicken. Meet Greg, a 27-year-old graphic designer who spent most of his free time at the gym. After a particularly long day at work, he was starving, so he pulled into a drive-thru to get some chicken nuggets. The nuggets were lukewarm and had a bit of a weird texture, underwhelming to say the least but he was too tired and hungry to care. A few days later, he woke up feeling nauseated, and it just got worse throughout the day with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and fever. He called in sick and had to take about a week off of work before his symptoms resolved on their own. Little did he know, this was just the beginning of his troubles. Things went back to normal for a couple of weeks, and then Greg started having some unusual symptoms. First, he developed a dull ache in his back followed by pins and needles in his feet, which wouldn't go away no matter what he tried. Over the next week, Greg noticed that he couldn't lift as much weight at the gym. His feet went from tingly to completely numb, then the same thing started happening to his hands and arms, and his movements felt slow and clumsy. The next morning, he didn't even have the strength to get out of bed, so he called 911 and he was brought to the emergency department. The emergency physician found that Greg had obvious weakness in his wrists, hips, and knees. But the most concerning finding was in his ankles and toes. He could still wiggle them slowly, but he couldn't push against any resistance at all. His hands and feet were objectively numb, and his ankles and patellar reflexes were completely gone. He didn't even twitch. With a detailed physical exam, you can usually figure out if the issue is in the central nervous system, meaning the brain and the spinal cord, or if it's in the peripheral nervous system, meaning the nerves that leave the spine and connect with your organs, skin, and muscles. In Greg's case, the lack of reflexes in his legs strongly pointed towards an issue with the peripheral nervous system. And the pattern of symmetrical numbness and weakness in his extremities suggested there was damage to the nerve roots, the area where the peripheral nerves plug into the spinal cord. So we would call this polyradiculoneuropathy. Yep, neurologists love their complex terminology, but it actually makes a lot of sense if you break it down. Something is wrong with multiple nerve roots and peripheral nerves. Now we just need to figure out what's causing this. Okay, so as you can see, there are many possible causes for a polyradiculoneuropathy. The first step was an MRI. Fortunately, this ruled out any neurosurgical emergencies, and it also gave Greg's doctors an important clue. Here's an MRI of the lower spine. You can see this cone where the spinal cord ends. This is where it branches off into many different nerve roots. Now, this is an MRI of the same patient after contrast dye was injected. You can see those nerve roots really light up. This is called enhancement, and it suggests those nerve roots are inflamed. So the next step is getting a sample of his cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. To do this, we perform a lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap. This is when you insert a large needle into the lower back between the bones of the spine, and then you push through layers of spinal ligaments until you get to the spinal fluid. The procedure went smoothly for Greg, and his doctors were able to get a good sample. He was then admitted to hospital while awaiting the results, and the neurologist on call agreed to see him urgently. Now, to make sure we're not missing anything on our list of possible causes, let's ask up-to-date expert AI, today's video sponsor. If you're not familiar with UpToDate, it's an evidence-based reference that I've relied on for the past 10 years. What I love is that its content is written and continually updated by top medical experts in their field using the latest clinical research. And recently, they've made it even better by adding expert AI. What makes this AI stand out to me is that it only searches within UpToDate's expert-authored, peer-reviewed, continuously updated content. And you can see exactly where it got the information by clicking on the references which take you directly to the source article. And in this case, it actually created a custom table for me on the spot. Although I won't show you its top pick because it correctly diagnosed our patient's condition. I already loved using UpToDate. And now, expert AI makes it faster and easier to find reliable answers to complex clinical questions. Okay, now let's get back to Greg. When he was seen by the neurologist, 
she took a much more detailed history. No exposure to ticks or neurotoxins, no throat or sinus infections, no other symptoms of porphyria, and no recent ICU admissions. He ate a standard diet and didn't drink alcohol, and his blood work didn't show any signs of lead poisoning or muscle inflammation. But she did uncover something that was missed in the emergency department, that bout of food poisoning that Greg had three weeks ago after eating those questionable chicken nuggets. Soon after, the results of the lumbar puncture came back. At first glance, it looked pretty much normal. Normal white blood cell count and no evidence of infection. Great. But there was one finding that stood out. Greg had a high protein level in his spinal fluid. And this is really interesting because normally when the nervous system becomes infected or inflamed, both the protein and the white blood cells rise together. But in Greg's case, it's only the protein level that's high. We call this albuminocytologic dissociation. While this finding on its own doesn't provide a diagnosis, when you put that together with rapidly progressive numbness, weakness, and loss of reflexes, all developing a few weeks after a diarrheal illness from undercooked chicken, it's absolutely classic for a condition called Guillain-Barré syndrome. So what is Guillain-Barré syndrome? And what does it have to do with undercooked chicken? Well, GBS is a rare condition where a person's immune system attacks and damages their own nerves. The official name for the type that Greg has is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. But as we've seen, neurologists like to be very descriptive. One of the most common triggers is a bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni. And you can catch it from unpasteurized raw dairy or, like in Greg's case, raw or undercooked chicken. And this isn't some rare bacterial contamination. Studies have shown that at least 20% of grocery store chicken is contaminated, with some sources estimating the rates are as high as 80%. And keep in mind that a single drop of raw chicken juice can contain enough bacteria to make you sick. Usually this involves diarrhea and a fever starting two to five days after exposure and lasting for about a week. Most of the time, symptoms will clear up on their own and that'll be the end of it. But for an unlucky few, Campylobacter is associated with autoimmune diseases like GBS. And the way that happens is fascinating. It all comes down to a case of mistaken identity by the immune system. After eating the undercooked chicken, Greg's gut immune cells identified the Campylobacter intruder and sent out an alert to the rest of the immune system. General attack cells like neutrophils and macrophages jumped into action, gobbling up the bacteria. At the same time, his immune system geared up for a more targeted response to kill every last one of the bacteria and prevent future infections. One key strategy is the creation of antibodies against the bacteria that will stick to them and mark them for destruction. So far, so good. Greg's immune system did its job, and over the course of a week, it killed off the Campylobacter and his diarrhea and fever resolved. But here's where things went wrong. Certain parts of the Campylobacter membrane look similar to parts of your nervous system. This molecular mimicry means that antibodies created by your immune system to recognize Campylobacter can also attach to your nerves, marking them for destruction. We actually have photo evidence of this happening. Researchers took a biopsy of the nerve root of someone with GBS. This black ring is the myelin sheath, which is a protein that covers many of your nerves. And you can see that this white blood cell is wedging itself under the myelin to peel it off the nerve, eat it, and destroy it. Isn't it incredible that we can actually see that happening in this image? Myelin is a very important protein that wraps around your nerves. You can think of it like insulation that allows nerve signals to travel quickly and smoothly. When myelin gets destroyed, signals to the muscles become weaker and slower before they ultimately stop altogether, which explains the weakness in Greg's arms and legs. Fortunately, Greg didn't need a biopsy to prove this was happening to his nerves. Instead, he had a nerve conduction study that measured the speed and strength of the electrical signal moving through his nerves. And that proved that there was damage to his myelin sheath, further supporting his diagnosis of GBS. So you might be wondering, if this was all related to a Campylobacter infection, why was there a two week delay between the original infection and the attack on Greg's nerves? Well, it all comes down to the different types of antibodies that the immune system produces. When you get an infection, your immune system first makes IgM antibodies, which appear quickly, 
but are short-lived. Then over the next one to two weeks, your immune system switches gears and creates an upgraded version called IgG antibodies. These are stronger and longer lasting. They're the ones that give you long-term immunity after you've had a sickness or a vaccine. And it's those IgG antibodies, the ones that take one to two weeks to form, that stuck to Greg's nerves and caused major damage. Okay, now let's put it all together. Greg ate chicken nuggets that were contaminated by Campylobacter jejuni, and the meat wasn't heated enough to kill the bacteria. This caused a diarrheal illness, and during that time, his immune system created antibodies against that bacteria. A few weeks later, his body started pumping out IgG antibodies, which attached to the myelin sheath coating his nerves. This is basically an eat me signal for macrophages, which dutifully started stripping the myelin off his nerves. His first symptom was back pain related to inflammation in that area. And as the myelin was stripped off, nerve signals were disrupted, which led to numbness and weakness in his limbs. By the time Greg went to the emergency department, his nerve roots were already so inflamed that we could see it on the MRI. That inflammation also caused protein from his bloodstream to leak into his spinal fluid. And he later had a nerve conduction study that confirmed there was severe damage to his myelin sheath, which was driving his symptoms. So what happened to Greg? Was he paralyzed forever? Well, the good news is that if you just wait long enough, Greg's immune system would stop producing high levels of those damaging antibodies, and then it's possible for the nervous system to start repairing itself. The bad news is that GBS symptoms continue to progress for two to four weeks before they plateau. And it's quite common for the nerves involved in breathing to become affected. That would mean transferring Greg to the ICU and hooking him up to a ventilator. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have a cure for Guillain-Barre syndrome, but we do have a few things we can do to slow it down. One option is plasma exchange. Basically, you run the patient's blood through a special machine that separates the blood cells from the plasma. The patient's blood cells are then mixed with a solution of albumin from healthy donors and pumped back into the patient's body. So the goal is to remove the antibodies that are attacking the nerves. But this requires highly specialized equipment that isn't available in every hospital. Luckily, there's another effective treatment option called intravenous immunoglobulins, or IVIG for short. IVIG is basically liquid gold. It's purified antibodies pooled from thousands of donors. Think three to 15,000 donors per batch. The goal is just to completely overwhelm the body with normal, non-harmful antibodies. This drowns out the signal from the bad antibodies and generally calms down the immune system. Greg received treatment with IVIG right away. But despite this, his weakness progressed over the next week until he was bed bound. He even needed help to get dressed and feed himself. Fortunately, with early treatment, it stopped short of affecting his breathing muscles. Things started to improve slowly from there. But keep in mind, it takes a long time for the nervous system to recover and rebuild that myelin sheath. Even with intensive physiotherapy, it took a few months before Greg was able to walk independently again, and almost a year before he felt he was back to his normal strength. But eventually, he did make a full recovery. This was a really good outcome for Greg, but that's not the case for everyone with GBS. Even with the best possible care, GBS is fatal for around 5% of people, and that number goes up to 20% if they ended up on a ventilator. So here's the moral of the story. If your chicken's pink, you've got to stop and think. Make sure you only eat chicken that's well-cooked. And remember, just a single drop of raw chicken juice can contain enough Campylobacter to cause you to get sick. So make sure you clean anything in the kitchen that comes in contact with raw chicken, like your sink, counter, and utensils. You won't always get GBS, but who wants seven days of fever and diarrhea? If you loved this video, then check out this medical mystery next, where a common healthy snack caused kidney damage. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, stay curious, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next one. So, bye for now.